Hello, everyone. Thanks again for joining me today. So today I wanted to talk to you about a message that I received from a uh, somebody that I have met over um, the internet. Like, you know, so many of us meet people online and we start uh, having conversations, having never met with one another. And so this woman is somebody who has always, you know, been so uh, engaged, reaching back to me, especially via Instagram, uh, via private messages. Sometimes I would send an email, um, you know, I would post something and she would send me uh, one of her comments or questions via private message, uh, having a question about this or sharing, um, you know, sharing a resource of this, uh, if I had seen this. And sometimes I get, I get back to her whenever I can. And sometimes though I'm traveling and I'm like, hey, you know, I'm, I'm on the road right now, but would love, but um, we'll get back to you when I'm back and so on, so, so on and so forth. So really one of those really, you know, nice online relationship with someone who truly seems to care. You can actually tell she cares. And, um, but um, a few weeks ago, after I made a, a post went out and obviously she's also, f um, you know, following me on Substack, there was a Substack message that seems to really have ticked her off. And then we also had a post on Instagram about that, uh, you know, Substack topic. And I think it was the Substack on um, how hard it is to do business. And really, we need to make it easier for entrepreneurs to do business in Africa. Uh, that's what it was about. And so I received this message from her, which I would like to read to you guys. Um, for the sake of her privacy, I will make sure that, you know, we're not sharing her name. But here it goes. She said, Hi, Magat. I followed your Substack until yesterday. I honestly have tried to put myself into your shoes and to do my very best to see things from your position. I'll forward you the post, but it is also the comment section which I cannot get on board with. If you would like all aid to be withdrawn from Africa, then fine. Do it on your own. I don't speak for all Europeans, and you certainly don't speak for all of Africa. But as far as running down well-meaning, passionate supporters of the continent goes, I cannot support that. I saw some really unpleasant comments yesterday in relation to how the West support African countries slash communities. The example given was that an NGO were teaching music and helping to teach people to grow food. Perhaps I have a very different way of looking at things. But in my country, if somebody offers a service to a community, there are two legitimate responses, yes or no. So perhaps that person's NGO that was doing good work in that community. Perhaps the community were happy to accept that help. Why is there such a negative spin out on things like this? Why does there have to be such a racial divide? The whole thing completely baffles and frustrates me. And then I asked her, of course, to please forward me the post that had um, obviously, you know, taken her over the edge, as well as some of the comments that she was referring to. Because I think it's always good to understand what people are talking about specifically and where, you know, so you can see where they're coming from and you can address it. Right. And so she sends me all of that information, sent me some screenshots of what bothered her um, in regards to what she said, and also the Instagram post that bothered her as well. And then she says, this was the post. I don't disagree with anything that you say per se, but it is the cumulative effect of a previous post and substacks and the comments that seem to imply that anyone who is an African in Africa is on the wrong side of a balance. Sometimes people just want to do something rather than turn a blind eye. But it seems like that isn't the right thing either. So we're damned if we do, and we're damned if we don't. So, of course, I thanked her for taking the time once more to supply me with all of this, you know, um, information as to what has caused her to want to, you know, retrench from, from further engagement. Um, I think it's very important to acknowledge people, especially when they are in engaging in civil discourse. And so this woman has always showed and uh, proved to be um, someone with great, you know, she shows respect. She's very civil and I appreciate that. And of course, for her to take the time to send a very courteous message about uh, a disagreement of hers, I think that's something that I always want to applaud. And if only everybody was like that in the world, we would have a much better world. Because the goal is not to agree on everything. 
but the goal is to always keep those lines of communications open. So in honor of her taking the time to share um, her feedback with me, I will also take the time to respond to her. And I told her that the subject um, warranted um, a video answer from me because sometimes, you know, just words on a screen don't always convey what you really want to convey. And I think this is important. This is important because I have seen so many uh, people, especially non-Africans who are very passionate about Africa and wanting to see Africa win. I've seen that. And yet they seem to not understand why an African woman who also cares about Africa, in this case me, would have such a passion against foreign aid. So I think it's important to address it, not only for her, but for the millions of other non-African supporters who seem to really have a hard time with um, people like me who are just saying, please, 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 no more aid. And uh, by the way, I think, um, the best the best book on this topic of why why so many of us do not want aid someone who does a great job of that and who at explaining it you know why aid is actually not such a foreign aid is not such a good idea it's uh, Dambi Samoyo she's a Zambian economist and she had written this book called Dead Aid I would suggest everyone who really is having a hard time understanding why Africans, some Africans, and she's right, I don't speak for all Africans, never claim to do so. I'm just representing my side of the argument. And so why people like us push back on the concept of foreign aid as the way forward for Africa. So, and I will start by saying, making it very clear, by now it should be very clear to everybody who is following me that Humanitarian aid is not the aid I have an issue with. When disaster strikes anywhere and with anyone, the rest of us, if we call ourselves civilized people with our hearts in the right place, we gotta go in there and help at all costs. That is never under question. And when I say aid, that's not what I'm referring to. So I just wanted to make sure that we're clear on that. But even humanitarian aid itself becomes a chronic and way of life. I would like to think that those of us who are paying attention would say, there is a problem. There is a problem. You know, <laughs> if, uh, if uh, 60 years later, as it is in most African nations, you know, for Africans to have to rely on the rice that's being sent to, from the outside world and such, I think we should be asking ourselves, what's going on here? So yes, when someone is hungry and it's a matter of life or death, feed this person or not, but there's no questions about that. We feed that person and we talk later. So that's very clear. So humanitarian aid, as long as it doesn't become chronic, where it doesn't mean we stop it, but, it, but we need to start wondering what can we do so that this doesn't become a way of life, humanitarian aid is off the table when it comes to my criticisms. What I have a huge issue with is foreign aid, meaning government to government aid, meaning when the citizens of Western nations primarily, because that's the way in which it's going, the Western nation to the supposedly, you know, poor non-Western countries for the most part, that's what I have an issue with. That's what people like Dembisa Moyo have an issue with in her book, Dead Aid. And again, for a deep dive, I recommend to everyone to read Dambisa Moyo's book, Dead Aid. Goes into details about it, beautiful, showing how this whole enterprise has not worked for since we have put it in place. And I mean, at some point, I like to say this, but uh, the definition of craziness is to keep doing the same thing, hoping for a different outcome. So some of us have to wonder what the heck is going on over here. So the reason that I, as an African, have an issue with foreign aid and maybe something that um, well-meaning promoters of foreign aid oftentimes have a hard time understanding why someone like me would have an issue with foreign aid is the fact that I do think that they're not always taking into account the cost-benefit analysis. As for everything in life, you know, reality is that life is about trade-offs. It's about trade-offs. So this woman, in one of her um, replies back as to talking about, you know, 
um, something very true when she says, on one of a comment from a subscriber of mine saying that we Africans are capable of preparing our own infrastructure, she said, uh, the thoughts of the roads of Lomi in Togo ran through her mind. Where there is no roaming infrastructure apart from dust. No, it's not the commenter's fault that roads only five kilometers away from the capital are made of dirt and that there is no drainage and that significant and severe weather patterns make roads impassable sometimes. But it's the attitude that I struggle with, the anger towards the West. To be honest, more blame should fall at the feet of the government because it's them who are failing the people, not the person who wants to do something to contribute to the prosperity of Africa. She's using one of my favorite words there, prosperity of Africa. So I've seen this, this reaction before. And I've always found that the best way to address it is like I'm saying, what, what I'm doing to do what I'm doing right now. <sighs> Life is about trade-offs. Yes, the roads are important. And yes, the cost involved in building a road is not something that the regular people, we can pull up our money together and send over. So these are very heavy infrastructure, got it, very expensive, got it, very complicated, got it. And I could see why we're thinking that this is something that's best addressed by foreign aid if the country itself doesn't have it in their national budget to take care of you. So if that's where the story stops, of course, the roads are great. But the story of roads being financed by foreign aid does not stop there. And so I think that it's very important for people who think that foreign aid is such a great idea to think about the rest of the story and the trade-offs. Benefit cost analysis here. Benefit, we got some roads. Great. And usually they're not even the best. But hey, we got some roads. It's better than nothing. I got it. But what does it mean to get those roads? And especially to get them through foreign aid, what does it mean? What we all need to remember is that when we get this foreign aid, what foreign aid means beyond the goods that you see, however good they are, is dependency, corruption, and potentially violence. Yes, violence. Let me walk you through those. Dependency. This is a little joke that some of us Africans have among ourselves. When you have been living since your independences sustained by aid, we're no different than other people, you know? If every day you wake up, I am supposedly doing for you what you should be doing for yourself. And let's not even talk about the reasons why you're not doing it for yourself. But the truth is that's something you should be doing for yourself. And day in and day out, that's how it works. You get to the point where you get people who expect everything to come from the government, everything to come from the outside world. We expect everything. So you have a culture of dependency that comes from the aid you know, the aid business. And that surely cannot be a good thing for the very people who are supposed to build up their nations, build up their sovereignty, build up their prosperity. And foreign aid, unfortunately, and this is well, you know, reported in research, promotes a culture of dependency that is definitely not good for if you want for people to be able to do things themselves so that they do it in their own terms and have the dignity as well as the independence that comes from it. So I get roads, but I also get a culture of dependency. Pick your trade-offs. I'm not happy about the, the dependency. On top of a dependency, corruption. You say it yourself. When you say, I think that's what you're alluding to, which we all know, she said, the anger towards the West. I will tell you why the anger towards the West. To be honest, more blame should fall at the feet of the governments because it's them who are failing the people, not the person who wants to do something to contribute to the prosperity of Africa. 
Do you know why these governments are the way they are? <clears throat> it's because when you are sending trillions of aid and that they get to, to keep a lot of it in their own pockets, to line their own pockets, your aid, your foreign aid is actually effectively going to feed that corruption. It's a huge contributor to these people, these leaders, who on top of that, they will fight each other through to death to access power. Because he who accesses power, controls the power, will control all of his foreign aid coming in. And this person who gets to the power is the one who is going to get to be able to buy chateaus in the south of France. Um, very expensive cars that actually even the richest people in, in, in America don't even drive. You, should, you would be amazed at the type of cars that you see on these roads sometimes. But they can't even drive on the roads because the roads are so crappy anyway. But hey, it's just like park somewhere and show like how, how much money I have. Or oh, I should say I diverted. That's foreign aid right there for you. Foreign aid plays a huge role in this. So you have people who will do anything to cling to the power. That's how we have presidents that are in power for 40 years, 38 years, not wanting to relinquish the power because the power that they have of being the president of these countries means that they get to suck up all of this foreign aid that is being sent home. Meanwhile, facing off with them, all the parties who want to take the power. So everybody is fighting for political power to be the president of a country or to be powerful. It's only in our nation where the politicians are richer than businessmen and businesswomen. Ask yourself where that comes from. It's not just the money that's being diverted from diluting the proceeds of our natural resources. Many African nations, at least a good half of their national budget comes from foreign aid. That's a lot of money. And as long as this money is going to keep on flowing, they will fight. People will fight. And it is proven that especially in the not so stable governments, the weaker governments, where it's just recently we're playing with this idea of government, like in Somalia, Somaliland, places like that, you know, where basically um, people, there are some very good reports, and I will also add the links for this, like, you know, well done research showing how basically um, our, the foreign aid that's going to these, some of these African nations is actually fueling the infighting and all the violence and all the death that goes in it uh, between two different factions because he, again, or she, who is going to control the power is going to be the one who gets to control this foreign aid that comes in. So I got the roads here. Few roads. Because that's the other thing too, you know. For the amount of money that supposedly was spent, sent to build these roads, and you look at the <laughs> laughable roads, they're still very few, not the best roads. I mean, we could be doing, we should be doing so much better with this, you know, with the money that was sent. And yet you just see like a tiny little percentage of what should have been done with the money that was sent because, you know, most of it went straight into the pocket of our leaders and the rest of it went straight back to Washington, Paris, and uh, places where the money came from in the first place through what we call um, poverty in the poverty industry. For that, watch Poverty Inc. It will show you how a lot of this foreign aid money actually goes straight back into the pocket of the people who so-called sent the money in the first place. So the leaders take a little chunk. The, the people who send the money, you know, the so-called Western nations that sent us the foreign aid, they take, they take back the lion's share of it through all of their different consultings, uh, consulting businesses, blah, blah, blah. We call it the poverty industry. Again, povertyinc.org will tell you a lot. Yeah. And meanwhile, the people, the people for, because of, for whom this whole system exists, they get crumbles. So for crumbles, because the roads are part of crumbles in this case, for crumbles, you know, little bag of rice over here in Baba, for crumbles, I get a culture of dependency for my people. I get corruption 
and people never wanting to leave power and people who are willing to do anything to access the power so they can control that foreign aid um, bag of money. And I also get potentially violence, actually oftentimes violence. So the cost benefit, the crumbles, and dependency, corruption, potentially violence. I mean, please, at, please, what's your cost benefit analysis telling you? This is the issue I have with foreign aid. This is the issue that people like me have with foreign aid. And of course, I don't speak for all of Africa. I never pretended to. But after 60 plus some years since the end of independences, to see where foreign aid, the only thing we've been doing with Africa, which is foreign aid, that's our big plan, where it has taken us, I'm sorry, because I'm not crazy, I don't expect that the same actions could potentially lead to a different outcome. So we've got to think of something different. And that's that. And my tone might not be to your liking, and that's okay. I have lost patience. Where I spend a lot of my time now is with people who are saying, I am very passionate about Africa. Clearly there is a problem. And what, are, what else should we try? It's encouraging at least to see that when you say, I don't disagree with anything that you say per se. But she seems to have an issue with my way of saying things. A, this is me. That's how I say things. If you have a problem with how I say it, I totally understand. But because you're saying you don't disagree with what I'm saying, I would still encourage you to maybe find other people who are saying what I'm saying, but maybe in a tone that, you, that suits you better. Personally, I am tired, tired of the time we have wasted. And every single day that goes by is more cultural dependency, more corruption, and more potential violence. You perceive anger. I feel moral urgency every single minute that God makes and keeps me alive. So I thought it was important for me to explain this. Again, I thank you for your taking the time to, in a civil way, reach out to me to say, you know, I consider myself a supporter of Africa and want to see Africa win. And I don't really disagree with anything you say, but I have an issue with the way it's been said. And you are also saying it's a cumulative effect. I understand the cumulative effect that you're talking about. You see, for the longest time, there seems to have been a consensus around the world, among Africans and non-Africans, as to why our continent to this day happens to be the poorest in the world. There are a few culprits that people throw around. Throw around. If you're talking to Africans and ask them why Africa is the poorest region in the world, actually, this is funny because I did this experiment on my Instagram. My two most um, viral Instagram posts, it's funny, it's asking the same question, but in a way, it's uh, addressing it to different side of the, uh, you know, of um, the are you African or non-African? And many Africans would come out saying, oh, it's because of colonialism. Oh, it's because of uh, the West is stealing our natural resources. Oh, it's because of racism. I hear all of these usual suspects that everybody talks about. And then on the non-Africa side, I've heard it all from the IQ fury to the, to the you guys are just lazy, to the you're so busy always fighting each other, nothing happens. You guys are savages, don't respect democracy, whatever. Yet, what do I see from both sides? What I don't see from both sides, from either side, I should say, is no one, no one brings up how hard 
it is to do business in most African nations. No one talks about the fact that insofar as prosperity is what we're after, that it is entrepreneurs who build prosperity. And that for entrepreneurs to do, build, create and build, they need very friendly business environments. I don't see either side talking about it. So you see, for the longest time, the diagnosis, the answer to the diagnosis as to why Africa is still the poorest region in the world, people throw all types of reasons to that question. Most of these answers, by the way, are beside the point when they're not just a symptom of the poverty in Africa. And no one talks about how prosperity is built. That is actually for those who talk about prosperity in the first place, because most people, when it comes to Africa, it's like, we should be happy with poverty alleviation. That's what people talk about when they talk about Africa. Poverty alleviation. Oh, how can we be just a little bit less poor? I mean, really? That's the best that I as an African can, you know, <laughs> have a goal for? Be a little bit less poor? Be a little bit less miserable? Don't take me wrong. It's nice if that's all that I can have. But is that really truly what all I can have? Is that truly all any of us should want to have? I don't speak for all Africans, but I'm speaking for this African, and I want more than just being a little bit less poor. Thank you very much. But if I want more than being just a little bit less poor, if I want prosperity, who builds prosperity? Entrepreneurs. Yet, I hear no one bring up the fact that except for maybe four nations on the continent and two of those just recently got on with the game, but except for four nations on the continent, everyone else is on the bottom half of the doing business index ranking of the World Bank, meaning that all of these nations, in all of these African nations, it is harder to do business in any of those places than it is in almost anywhere else in the world. If your entrepreneurs don't have the freedom to enterprise, you simply will not see the prosperity that they build. The jobs, all of that good stuff, non-existent. People stay poor and the rest of the world will be like, oh, geez, isn't it terrible? Let's send them foreign aid. You send your foreign aid, crumbs end up with the people in the form of roads, sack of, you know, bag of, uh, bag of rice or millets or whatever. And the bulk of the money goes back straight into the pockets of the people who sent uh, the foreign aid in the first place while another big chunk goes into the pocket of our leaders. And when you're doing that, there's another force that I didn't bring up earlier, is um, the people who send us the government, who send us this aid, they, happen, they then get to do on us what we call neocolonism. Because he who holds the gold makes the rules. That's another one. That's another uh, trade-off of the little crumbs that stay with us through foreign aid. So now we have dependent, a culture of dependency, we have corruption, and we have, and we have uh, violence, and we have neo-colonialism. France get to tell us what to do, the Americans get to tell us what to do, they get to interfere with all of our internal policies and affairs, and so on and so forth. And I'm supposed to support foreign aid and be happy about foreign aid and think like everything is great? No, no, I'm not. I am not. And so when you see me address foreign aid, I think it's important to address this because this is what's in the mind of so many people. How do we help Africa? Foreign aid! Every time you send me this, this aid, you're sending me poison. You're not seeing the, you know, like any medication. Again, life is about trade-off. All the way to drugs, medication. Every single pharmaceutical drug and every single thing comes with its benefits as well as its um, side effects. And as it turns out, foreign aid has way more side effect, in some cases deadly side effects, than it has um, benefits. What is so hard to understand about that? And do you really expect me to be like this when I speak about it and be like, <laughs> everything is great, yeah? Oh no, I know, you, 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 you're well in 
attention? You know, it's once I started paying attention to all of this that I finally perceived in my bones the meaning of the road to hell is paved with good intentions. There is too much moral urgency around this for me to be able to even, even smile about this. And I am aware that you don't attract flies with vinegar. I'm aware of that. But I also made peace with the fact that I am not the best one to talk to everybody. And that's perfectly fine. The only thing I can do is keep on marching with my truth. And there are people out there. I'm seeing them every day. People who have been as frustrated as I have been. And it's not a matter of them being African, non-African, black, not black, living on the continent, not living on the continent. People from all walks of life have seen what I've seen. And people from all walks of life have been telling themselves, there's something really rotten here. And there are people from all other walks of life. When I bring this up, they're like, gee, man, it makes sense. And what do we do about this? Because we got to, time is of essence here. So maybe those are the only people I can talk to. And that's okay. It takes a village. And I have accepted my role in this village. So it is too bad that, um, you know, this diagnosis sometimes seems to irk some people. I get it. I get it. When you have invested your whole, so much of your time and sometimes even your own personal identity on supporting a certain thing. And all of a sudden to be told, what are you doing? What are you doing? This is not right. I can understand that you can be thinking, what's your problem? I'm helping. It's not because you're helping that I should take your help at all cost. It is actually, it's because you're trying to help and that I respect that and I appreciate that so much that it's also my job and my role to say, you know, you might not see this because you're not there or whatever. You know, we all come at things from different angles. And it's, again, not a matter of race. And by the way, I'm not someone you hear talk about race. But one of my uh, subscribers or followers or fans brings up, you know, says bypassing that, uh, you know, and these white people coming and uh, teaching the African uh, farmers how to, or African people how to farm. And you get offended by that because maybe I put a, uh, you know, I seem to, to say, yeah, I mean, really, I mean, yeah, yeah, I did that and I will do it again. Because what you're missing, the context you're missing in this, if you just remove it from your own person, we don't know you. We're not criticizing you. She brought up something very particular that almost every African is aware of, and it is flat out condescending. Sending someone from the outside world. So oftentimes, these young people who back home, they wouldn't even know how to get out of their own city if they were left to have to manage, you know, to, to go from point A to point B on their own. But all of a sudden they get flown in to come and show the this <laughs> African person how to tend to the land. Not even knowing that um, there's one thing that Africans know how to do, it's to tend to a plot of land. Almost all Africans, you know, have a plot of land or couple uh, livestock to take care of. However small it is, many people living in, subsist with sub in subsistence farming. So if you're just going to come and show them how to take care of a little plot of land, that's downright um, condescending. And that's all she was saying. And I know what she's talking about because I got the context. It's oftentimes white people that are sent. Me, that's not what I would focus on. I would focus more on sending people to come and, uh, you know, training, uh, uh, supposedly teaching people who know how to farm, how to farm. Now, if you were coming with your big machines and some big investment for some productive type of farming because you're using this technology or that technology, stuff like that, transfer of uh, technology and skills, yes, yes. I would never be offended by something like that because, you know, you're pulling things up. 
but this, but you to come and think that all it is is to teach us how to, you know, plant carrots and grow carrots and uh, handle the plotting the seeds this way. You're saying that you don't think we know what, how to do that. Because when you're doing that, you're forgetting that the real diagnosis here is that this person A may not have access to funds. So knowing how to farm is not the problem in this case. If you're not going to bring anything else, uh, any other type of knowledge than just, you know, farming good old way. So unless, again, you're bringing like some drones and showing people how they can use the drones um, to go and fly over some crops and be able to see uh, which plant needs extra irrigation, not irrigation, or you're bringing like these new um, techniques of farming, some of them even using maybe container farming uh, because of, you know, where you have a better controlled environment and not have to deal with all of these uh, pests and having to do pest control. If that's what you bring to the table, that's always welcome everywhere, anytime, all the time. But to come to people who have tending to plots of land forever and to, for you to be like, oh, I'm going to teach you how to do that. No, what that person oftentimes needs is, like I said, more funding. So poverty, again, is a problem. And or what, what is the modern way of farming? Or what's happening right now that's available that you might not have or might not some training on. That's always welcome. So that's not what we're making fun of. And so I guess that offended you, but this is going to happen. And ideally, when you see stuff like that, you understand we're not talking about you per se, unless you're doing this. And if you were even doing this, me, I show up with, wait, guys, you know, when I'm trying to help someone and all of a sudden they're like, but clearly you can tell there is a problem. Me, if really the reason why I'm there is to help, then what I do is, what am I missing? What am I missing? Okay, it might not be fun to be hearing when you're helping someone to be hearing, oh, <coughs> but it's not helping or whatever. It's not fun. I get it. But if you're really in for helping, I, at least for myself, I know that what I want to hear the most about is how can I be most efficient? Because I'm not here to waste my time. I'm not here to waste my time. But of course, if it's my identity that's involved with this, then maybe there is a different problem. And I think it's okay, and actually everyone should ask themselves, why am I in, in this? Is it to feel better about myself or is it what truly I want to support? Me, as with anything I do, I want to know that I'm being efficient. I want to know that I'm being impactful. That's the key word. Impactful. Otherwise, why am I wasting my time? And your feedback means everything. Because we can't see everything. We all come at things from a different angle. And it's the beauty of it. And that's why we all should work together. But it's not going to work well if um, we're also not understanding you know, or having that humility of a person who really wants to be impactful. If you want to be impactful, you also have to be humble. And I'm reminded of that every single day myself. So am I going to try to sometimes, you know, take into account, you know, like what seems to upset you in terms of this, I will. Every time where it's warranted for, I will. But um, when it comes to having to pound harder a diagnosis that gets lost in this huge noise and distraction that the world has created around poverty in Africa for the past 60 plus years, I have to speak louder and I have to be firm. And all of that with a supreme dose of moral urgency. This is urgent. And such a person, I can only be what I am. I'm this passionate person. And so I hope this was helpful in terms of understanding where I'm coming from. And um, I hope you continue to support the continent, but it is also important to know the ways that help, the ways that don't help, and if nothing else, to understand the trade-offs.
you may not agree with where I settled on, on my cost benefit, benefit analysis. But I think it's important to put it out there. And then choose where you want to try and have impact. But that's all I can do and that's all I can say. Um, with that, I want to thank again people who are involved in civil discourse. Clearly, you know, there are many passionate people about this issue. This is, you know, where I'm coming from. And I attempted to explain where I'm coming from. Hopefully, it's helpful in understanding how I come to things and why I do what I do. And, um, you know, at the end of the day, thanks for your time. Share your comments, your remarks. I'm always all ears. Let's keep it civil. Let's keep it constructive. And um, let's keep on trying on being impactful. But it is important to understand trade-offs. It, it is important to hear and to see what others who might be in different shoes see and hear. And sometimes, if you feel that it's not delivered in a way that suits you, yet you still want to be impactful, I think it's, it's important to stay with the discomfort a little bit. 